Okay, today is the 1st of September 2010 and this is the 43rd time we're speaking on the Majjhima Nikaya Suttas. Now we come to Sutta 105, Sunakata Sutta, Tu Sunakata. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Vesali in the Great Wood in the hall with a big roof. On that occasion, a number of monks had declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One thus. We understand birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Sunakata, son of the Lichavi, is heard. A number of monks, it seems, have declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One thus. We understand birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, etc. There is no more coming to any state of being. Then Sunakata, son of the Lichavis, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, I have heard, Venerable Sir, that a number of monks have declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One. Did they, did they do so rightly, or are there some monks here who declare final knowledge because they overestimate themselves? And those monks, Sunakata, declared final knowledge in my presence. There were some monks who declared final knowledge rightly, and there were some who declared final knowledge because they overestimated themselves. Therein, when monks declare final knowledge rightly, their declaration is true. But when monks de declare final knowledge because they overestimate themselves, the Tathagata thinks, let me teach them the Dhamma. Thus it is in this case, Unakata, that the Tathagata things. Let me teach them the Dhamma. But some misguided men here formulate a question. Come to the Tathagata and ask it. In that case, Sunakata, though the Tathagata has thought, let me teach them the Dhamma, he changes his mind. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says, uh, some monks, uh, when they uh, say that they have become liberated, some are actually liberated, but some are not. Of those that are not liberated, the Buddha thinks of teaching them further. But some of them, they are not humble enough. And they, they come to ask the Buddha a question, probably to debate with the Buddha one, or to test the Buddha one. So the Buddha... Changes, the, changes his mind about teaching them the Dhamma. And uh, Sunakata said, This is the time, Blessed One, this is the time, Sublime One, for the Blessed One to teach the Dhamma. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Then listen, Sunakata, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, Sunakata, son of the Lichavis, replied to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said, There are Sunakata, these five cords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five cords of sensual pleasure. It is possible, Sunakata, that some person here may be on, intent on worldly material things. When a person is intent on worldly material things, only talk concerning that interests him, and his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person, and he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the imperturbable is going on, he will not listen to it, or give it ear, or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person, and he does not find satisfaction through him. Suppose Sunakata, a man had left his own village or town a long time ago, and he were to see another man who had only recently left that town or village. He would ask that man whether the people of that village or town were safe, prosperous and healthy. And that man would tell him whether the people of that village or town were safe, prosperous and healthy. What do you think, Sunakata? Would that first man listen to him, give him ear, 
and exert his mind to understand. Yes, Venerable Sir. So too, Sunakata, it is possible that some person here may be intent on worldly material things. When a person is intent on worldly material things, he does not find satisfaction through him. He should be understood as a person who is intent on worldly material things. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that worldly people uh, uh, will only want to talk about worldly things. I uh, want to find other worldly people to talk to. Uh, but when you talk to them about states of meditation that are deep and all that, uh, imperturbable, uh, they are not interested. Uh. It is possible, Sunakata, that some person here may be intent on the imper imperturbable. When a person is intent on the imperturbable, only talk concerning that interests him. And his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person, and he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about worldly material things is going on, he will not listen to it, or give it ear, or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person, and he does not find satisfaction through him. Just as a yellow leaf that has fallen from its stalk is incapable of becoming green again. So too, Sunakata, when a person is intent on the imperturbable, he has shed the factor of worldly material things. He should be understood as a person not bound by the factor of worldly material things, who is intent on the imperturbable. It is possible, Sunakata, that some person here may be intent on the base of nothingness. When a person is intent on the base of nothingness, only talk concerning that interests him, and his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person, and he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the imperturbable is going on, he will not listen to it, or give it ear, or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person, and he does not find satisfaction through him. Just as a thick stone that has split in two cannot be joined together again, so too Sunakata, when a person is intent on the base of nothingness, his factor of the imperturbable has been split. He should be understood as a person not bound by the factor of the imperturbable, who is intent on the base of nothingness. Stop here for a moment now. Normally when we talk on the imperturbable, uh, we mean the four jhana and the arupas uh, or arupa jhanas. Uh. But here you can see uh, uh, this uh, imperturbable here uh, refers to the four jhana, the base of boundless space and the base of boundless consciousness. Uh. So the Buddha separates uh, the base of nothingness uh, and later the base of neither perception nor non-separation or non-perception. Uh. Uh, from the the, the former. So, in this sutta, the imperturbable refers to the fourth jhana, the fourth rupa jhana, the base of uh, boundless space and the base of boundless consciousness. Uh, so, so when we compare to the earlier section, uh, uh, if a person has attained to the fourth jhana, then uh, uh, he is no more interested la, in the worldly material things. Uh, so here section 10 uh, talks about the person uh, intent on the imperturbable, la, one who has attained the fourth jhana or the base of boundless space or boundless consciousness. He uh, is no more interested in the uh, worldly material things la, because the bliss uh, of the fourth jhana is so, how do you say, so, uh, so, so high uh, that uh, he gets, he derives so much uh, happiness uh, and pleasure uh, in the fourth jhana that is that uh, worldly material things uh, is nothing uh, compared to to this uh, bliss of the fourth jhana. So he's no more interested. Uh, so you can see from here. And that's why when you compare it with some other sutta, uh, you know, there is Majjhima Nikaya fourteen. Uh, where Mahanama came to ask the Buddha, he said, Bhagawa, um, although he understands the Dhamma, he says, uh, in spite of having understood the Dhamma, he says sometimes uh, 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 this uh, greed, hatred and delusion uh, still uh, overcomes him. Uh, and then he asked with the Buddha whether he, he, he has not uh, developed something, uh, he has not attained something. And the Buddha says, yes. Uh, the Buddha says, uh, he has not attained the piti and sukha. 
that is uh, secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states. Lah. That means uh, it has not attained one pointedness of, nine, of mind, lah, jhana. Lah. So what the Buddha means is that if a person has attained jhana, uh, the bliss uh, is so high, uh, is no more interested in worldly material things. Uh, and here, especially the fourth jhana, uh, the fourth jhana, the imperturbable, uh, is so, the bliss uh, is so much uh, higher than worldly uh, pleasures uh, or sensual pleasures uh, that uh, is... If a person has attained the fourth jhana, is utterly no more interested in worldly material things. Uh, and then uh, after that, on section 12, the Buddha says, if a person has atta- attained the base of nothingness, uh, that is even higher, uh, then he's also no more interested in the ba- in the imperturbable. Uh. It is possible, Sunakata, that some person here may be intent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. When a person is intent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception, only talk concerning that interests him, and his thinking and pondering are in line with that, and he associates with that kind of person, and he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the base of nothingness is going on, he will not listen to it, or give it ear, or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person and he does not find satisfaction through him. Suppose a, man, a person has eaten some delicious food and thrown it up. What do you think, Sunakata? Could that man have any desire to eat that food again? No, Wemble, sir. Why is that? Because that food is considered repulsive. So too, Sunakata, when a person is intent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception, his, his factor of the base of nothingness has been rejected. He should be understood as a person not bound by the factor of the base of nothingness, who is intent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. It is possible, Sunakata, that some person here may be completely intent on Nibbana. When a person is completely intent on Nibbana, only talk concerning that interests him, and his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person, and he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the base of neither perception nor non-perception is going on, he will not listen to it, or give it ear, or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person, and he does not find satisfaction through him. Just as a palm tree with its top cut off is incapable of growing again, so too, Sunakata, when a person is completely intent on Nibbana, this factor of the base of neither perception nor non-perception has been cut off, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. It should be understood as a person not bound by the factor of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, who is completely intent on Nibbana. Stop here for a moment. Now. So here, if a person has attained the base of neither perception nor non-perception, now, at that point, uh, the consciousness uh, is wavering. Uh, it's almost like a flame going to die off. Uh. Sometimes it's percipient, sometimes it's not percipient. Uh. So that is a very high state. Uh, and uh, when he has achieved that state, uh, lower states is no more interested. Uh. But then the final one, uh, intent of Nibbana, uh, probably refers to the uh, cessation of perception and feeling. Uh. When a person attains the cessation of perception and feeling, uh, consciousness also stops. Uh, and the Buddha says uh, that that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is the highest bliss, uh, nibbana paramang sukang. Uh, so this uh, base, uh, this uh, cessation of perception and feeling, uh, uh, is is that state uh, where the six consciousness stops. Uh, and when the six consciousness stops, uh, then, then the Buddha says uh, that the, that's the highest bliss. Uh, mm, it's si- similar to the state of Maha, this uh, Parinibbana. Uh, mm. It is possible, Sunakata, that some monk here might think that craving has been called an arrow by the recluse, that is the Buddha. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by desire, lust and ill will. The arrow of craving has been removed from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. Because he falsely thinks of himself thus, he might pursue those things that are unsuitable for one completely intent on Nibbana. 
He might pursue the sight of unsuitable form to the eye. He might pursue unsuit. He might pursue unsuitable sound to the ear. Unsuitable odors with the nose. Unsuitable flavors with the tongue. Unsuitable tangibles with the body. Or unsuitable mind objects with the mind. When he pursues the sight of unsuitable forms with the eye, etc., lust invades his mind. With his mind invaded by lust, he would incur death or deadly suffering. A poor Sunakata, a man were wounded by an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a surgeon. The surgeon would cut around the opening of the wound with a knife, and he would probe for the arrow with a probe. Then he would pull out the arrow and would expel the poisonous humor, leaving a trace of it behind. Knowing that a trace was left behind, he would say, Good man, the arrow has been pulled out from you. The poisonous humor has been expelled with a trace left behind, but it is incapable of harming you. Eat only suitable food. Do not eat unsuitable food, or else the wound would suppurate. From time to time, wash the wound, and from time to time, anoint its opening, so that pus and blood do not cover the opening of the wound. Do not walk around in the wind and sun, or else dust and dirt may infect the opening of the wound. Take care of your wound, good man, and see to it that the wound heals. The man would think the arrow has been pulled up from me. The poisonous humor has been expelled, with no trace left behind, and it is incapable of harming him, of harming me. He would eat unsuitable food, and the wound would suppurate. He would not wash the wound from time to time, nor would he anoint its opening from time to time. And pus and blood would cover the opening of the wound. He would walk around in the wind and sun, and the dust and dirt would infect the opening of the wound. He would not take care of his wound, nor would he see to it that the wound heals. Then, both because he does not, because he does what is unsuitable, and because the foul, poisonous humor. Had been expelled with a trace left behind, the wound would swell, and with its swelling, he would incur death or deadly suffering. So too, Sunakata, it is possible that some monk here might think craving has been called an arrow by the recluse. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by desire, lust, and ill will. The, that arrow of craving has been removed from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am completely intent upon nibbana. Because he falsely thinks of himself thus, he might pursue those things that are unsuitable for one completely intent on nibbana, etc. Uh, so, uh, with his mind invaded by lust, he would incur death or deadly suffering. For it is death in the discipline of the noble one, Sunakata, when one abandons the craving and reverts to the lower life. And it is deadly suffering when one commits some defiled offense. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says, uh, sometimes a monk, uh, he overestimates himself. Uh, he thinks he has no more craving. Uh, he has let go of everything. Uh, but he has not. Uh, just like the wound, uh, there is still some uh, humor of this uh, you call it? Uh, poisonous humor. Uh, some poisonous uh, liquid uh, is still left there. Uh, so in the same way, when a monk overestimates himself, uh, he thinks he has cut, um, eliminated craving, uh, but there's still some craving in, in, in him. Uh, so just as the wound uh, may, uh, uh, how do you say, would, uh, the wound would uh, suppurate, the wound would uh, uh, get worse, uh, pus and blood would form. Uh, uh, so in the same way, uh, if he's not careful, uh, he doesn't watch his uh, six sense doors, uh, then he looks at unsuitable sights, hears unsuitable sounds, etc. And then uh, uh, he would be invaded by lust. Uh, lust invades his mind. Uh, and then either he would disrobe or he would commit some uh, heavy offense, uh, break uh, some major precept. Uh, uh, so that that is death, death or deadly suffering. Uh, so sometimes uh, it's very easy uh, for a monk to overestimate himself. Uh, even when a person just goes forth, uh, sometimes he thinks, uh, oh, he has let go already. He has only let go on the outside, uh, but the inside uh, is, is difficult to remove. Uh, the attachment inside, uh, especially 
right? A monk has just gone forth. Uh, the Buddha says uh, this tie, uh, the family tie, uh, is extremely strong. Uh, this family tie is stronger uh, than iron chains. Uh, iron chains uh, is nothing uh, compared to this uh, attachment, uh, family attachment. Uh, so. Uh, for a monk, uh, the first few years, uh, it's very important that he completely cut off, uh, sever this uh, family ties. Uh, otherwise, uh, he, he's still chained by this uh, attachment, uh, family attachment. Mm. That's why when a person intends to go forth, uh, it is good uh, to go forth in a foreign country. Uh, just like last time when I went forth in America, uh, there's a lot of suffering. Uh, but because you're so far from home, there's <laughs> just no chance to go back. Uh, okay, it is possible, Sunakata, that some monk here might think that craving has been called an arrow by the recluse. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by desire, lust, and ill will. That arrow of craving has been removed from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. Being one who really is completely intent on Nibbana. He would not pursue those things that are unsuitable for one, completely intent on Nibbana. He would not pursue the sight of unsuitable forms with the eye. He would not pursue unsuitable sounds with the ear, unsuitable odors with the nose, unsuitable flavors with the tongue, unsuitable tangibles with the body, or unsuitable mind objects with the mind, because he does not pursue the sight of unsuitable forms, etc. Lust does not invade his mind. Because his mind is not invaded by lust, he would not incur death or deadly suffering. Suppose Sunakata, a man were wounded by an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives, brought the surgeon. The surgeon would cut around the opening of the wound with a knife. Then he would probe for the arrow with a probe. Then he would pull out the arrow and would expel the poisonous humor without leaving a trace of it behind. Knowing that no trace was left behind, he would say, Good man, the arrow has been pulled out from you. The poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace left behind, and it is incapable of harming you. Eat only suitable food. Do not eat unsuitable food, or else the wound may suppurate. From time to time, wash the wound, and from time to time, anoint its opening, so that pus and blood does, do not cover the opening of the wound. Do not walk around in the wind and sun, or else dust and dirt may infect the opening of the wound. Take care of your wound, good man, and see to it that the wound heals. The man, the man would think, the arrow has been pulled out from me, the poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace left behind, and it is incapable of harming me. He would eat only suitable food, and the wound would not suppurate. From time to time he would wash the wound, and from time to time he would anoint its opening, and pus and blood would not cover the opening of the wound. He would not walk around in the wind and sun, and dust and dirt would not infect the opening of the wound. He would take care of his wound, and would see to it that the wound heals. Then because... Then both because he does what is suitable and because the foul poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace left behind, the wound would heal. And because it had healed and was covered with skin, he would not incur death or deadly suffering. So too, Sunakata, it is possible that some monks here might think thus, Craving has been called an arrow by the recluse. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by desire, lust, and ill will. That arrow of craving has been pulled out from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. Being one who really is completely intent on Nibbana, he would not pursue those things unsuitable for one completely intent on Nibbana, etc., and because his mind is not invaded by lust, he would not incur death or deadly suffering. So, here the Buddha gives uh, the instance of a person uh, who, has come, who has finished his job. Uh, he has uh, uh, he has expelled uh, completely uh, uh, ignorance and craving. Uh, but even then, uh, uh, he would not go and uh, look at unsuitable forms. He would not hear unsuitable sounds, etc. Uh, uh, 
uh, also because he has no more interest. Uh, so, but then you see, uh, before a person uh, can be completely intent on Nibbana, he must pass through uh, the various stages. Uh, he must attain the imperturbable first, the fourth jhana, the base of neither, uh, at least the fourth jhana, uh, and uh, if possible, the base of, night, of, of, of boundless space and boundless consciousness. Uh. And there are some arahants uh, who attain these arupas. There are some arahants who do not attain these arupas. Uh. But to have completed the work, uh, the, um, a monk would need uh, at least the fourth rupa jhana. Uh. In which case, uh, he would not be interested anymore uh, in worldly things. Uh in sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Uh -huh. Sunakata, I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning here. Wound is a term for the six internal bases. That means uh, the eye, uh, the ear, the nose, the tongue, body, and mind. Poisonous humor is a term for ignorance. Arrow is a term for craving. Probe is a term for mindfulness or recollection. Knife is a term for noble wisdom. Surgeon is a term for the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha. When Sunakata, a monk practices restraint in the six bases of contact, and having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, is without attachment, liberated by the destruction of attachment, it is not possible that he would direct his body or arouse his mind towards any object of attachment. Suppose Unakata, there were a bronze cup of beverage possessing a good color, smell and taste, but it was mixed with poison, and a man came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoil from, spade, from pain. What do you think, Unakata? Would that man drink that cup of beverage, knowing, if I drink this, I will incur death or deadly suffering? No, Vembel, sir. So too, when a monk practices restraint in the six bases of contact, and having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, is without attachment, liberated by the destruction of attachment, it is not possible that he would direct his body or arouse his mind towards any object of attachment. Suppose, Unakata, there were a deadly poisonous snake, and a man came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoil from pain, what do you think, Sunakata? Would that man give that deadly poisonous snake his hand or his thumb, knowing if I am bitten by him, I will incur death or deadly suffering? No, Venable Sir. So too, when a monk practices restraint in the six bases of contact, and having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, is without attachment, liberated by the destruction of attachment, it is not possible that he would direct his body or arouse his mind towards any object of attachment. That is what the Blessed One said. Sunakata, son of the Lichavis, was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, the end of the Sutta. So here you can see uh, the, the Buddha is saying uh, that any object of attachment uh, uh, is like a poisonous drink uh, or a venomous snake. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, that... Uh, uh, when a monk uh, practices restraint in the six pieces of contact and having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, is without attachment uh, and liberated. Uh, it is not possible that he would direct his body or arouse his mind uh, towards any object of attachment. Uh, this contradicts the later teachings uh, found in the Mahayana and uh, this uh, Tibetan uh, school. Uh, in the Mahayana, like for example, Vimalakirti Sutra, where they say the Bodhisattva uh, enjoys uh, socializing and a worldly life, uh, and yet uh, he is supposed to be higher than the Arhan. And in the uh, uh, Tibetan teachings, uh, they say that the uh, enlightened person uh, can still engage in this, uh, uh, what they call Tantric Buddhism, where uh, the master uh, can have sex with the disciple. Uh, uh, this uh, is completely uh, contradictory uh, to the early Dhamma found in the suttas. Uh, it's not possible that uh, in the some other sutta is mentioned uh, that an arahan. Uh, it's not possible for an arahan uh, to uh, to purposely kill, to steal, uh, 
to engage in sexual intercourse, uh, to lie or cheat people. Uh, it's not possible. And even do anything wrong uh, because of greed, hatred, or delusion, or fear. Uh, so, so this sutta is, uh, is, is, is very good uh, because uh, sometimes uh, we overestimate ourselves uh, if you are on the spiritual path. So, uh, whether we have uh, finished the job or not, uh, uh, this sutta cautions us uh, not to uh, have uh, uh, to to be very cautious uh, in the six sense basis, uh, not to see unsuitable sights, not to hear unsuitable sounds, etc. Uh, 